And welcome, ladies well, and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, a man, a man, a man behind, behind the store. Behind the legend that is Stormwing, as well as pl as well as plenty of um, R RPGs and game books, which is going to be the subject matter t um, tonight. The one and only, the Disco Soup himself, Jake Jacob D D C Ross. How you doing today, man? I am fantastic. Very happy to be here. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming on and braving the hell of time zones in the process. <laughs> um, so, I've uh, now in the the past in the past we've talked a, we've talked a little bit about game books, specifically when you were kickstarting your own game book projects. Um, right. But I don't think I don't think you I don't think we ever really get we ever really got into where where your introduction to game books uh, came from. Oh yeah, oh okay. actually, game books and I it's um, pretty much been an entire life thing for me because the the first ones that I ever read would uh, were with my dad actually he'd mm -hmm. uh, get some from the local library which local being like a half hour drive because we lived in the woods, but he would uh, read them to us at night, my brother and I before bed, and we would have a lot of fun picking out the stories and then freaking out when we got eaten by sharks because we were only four. But uh, I've those are my first game book experiences, the Choose Your Own Adventure series. And basically ever since then, uh, it's been a goal of mine to write interactive books so that some kids growing up can have the same fun of discovery and retrying and frustrations of death and <laughs> dying again that I did as I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I used to anything I could get my hands on. They had uh, Mario type scenarios. They had one that was educational. It was like a time travel one. Uh, I think it was just called Time Machine. Uh, and I want to even say they had a Carmen San Diego game book. Um, but that was, you know, the, from my youth, those were the ones that I was into a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will, I will, I will freely, freely admit that one of my early intros when it came to game books was the, was the, um, was the old choose your own adventure books. Um, which I which I ended up getting not even second hand more like third hand. Um, a lot of those have a lot of wear and tear. Yeah. Um. And they they were they were not they were nice. I do re I do remember a f I, my full my first full on game book with the with a sh with a sheet dice and all and all that was um was something I got out of Scholastic. I think it was a, it was a Star Wars one called Assault on Yavin 4. Ooh. Oh. I haven't read that one. That one sounds cool. Um take it take it with a grain of salt. It was it was I ended I ended up getting it in middle school. It was very clearly designed for that kind for a middle school audience. So don't don't go in there expect expecting the expecting the citizen cane of of game book design, um, especially since this was this was around the time that the, that that they were that they were really pushing to put Star Wars back into public consciousness because the spe um, episode one hadn't come out yet, but the special editions and the and the theatrical re-releases were in the public consciousness at the time. Yeah. Okay. So, it's one. It's one yeah. of those. Thi Go ahead. Oh, just uh, an odd time for sure. Mm -hmm. Um. That that being that being said, that kind of thing provides an 
those two those two set those two games provide an interesting little um, divide because especially when I ended up when I ended up looking into when I ended up looking into things and looking at the history of game books I don't I don't think it would be off base of me to say that the real pioneers when it came to the history of game books especially in the 80s were across the pond in the UK agree um especially especially Jackson and Livingstone yeah um and while 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 it was certainly not limited to th- to those two over in the UK or in or in Europe, that's that's kind of where th- that's kind of where things really went. And I think what's what's really telling is the divide between the whole between the whole multiple choices through through a book and actually trying to do a a um a character a character sheet even in a mi- even in a micro form. Yeah. Yeah, they um it was like light years ahead. And I appreciate about uh Starship or um about fighting fantasy is that they really just they tackled every genre and just explored a lot of creativity that you didn't see in other game book series. Yeah. Um but that br- that brings me to that brings me to one question I have regarding um game regarding game book design. Um, okay. How Im- how important how important do you think do you think it, it do you think it is to have some sort of randomizer whether it be whether it be whether it be um di- whether it be dice or so- or something else. I mean it can be in the sense that nowadays i think your audience kind of expects it uh there is a series of game books they only created two of them and they were in the mid 90s called um virtual reality Mm -hmm. and they didn't have randomizers but instead you had to uh collect certain keywords and keep track of uh if I remember right in the first one, because I haven't read the second one, which is called Heart of Ice, and I've heard is the greatest game book ever written. Mm-hmm. So I'll have to look it up. But the first one was a standard medieval fantasy, you know, type where you're trying to find a hidden castle. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you, you would lose HP based on bad choices. Um, I think they did it pretty brilliantly. And if I'm going to be honest, I cheat all the time when I do these game books and I know everyone else does too. Uh, you know, S- Steve Jackson, he said, you know, everyone's got five bookmarks on their left hand. That's what they're there for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think from a, from a, like a sales point of view, a lot of people expect randomizers, but it would be cool if we didn't have to tie ourselves to them. Um, an- another uh, thing that got me thinking that is I made friends with this fella named Yehuda Shapira who made a game book called... Uh, oh my gosh. Um, I'm drawing a blank here. Let me Google it. I cannot believe it. I did a stream on it and everything. Uh, Return of Zaltek. Mm-hmm. And it's basically based on um, if you've ever played like the old DOS RPGs, point and click Sierra adventures, you know, like King's Quest or Quest for Glory. Yeah, I ha- I have. Although I I will admit that um, King's Quest has been King's Quest has been a game that's been my punching bag for years for for a very specific reason. Um, you may have you may have heard me use the term called that called that I call hand breaking. Um, I'm sorry, which term? Hand breaking. It is basically oh, is basically the polar opposite of hand holding, where the solution to an obstacle is is far too obtuse that that a uh, that you couldn't figure out the solution without some degree of foreknowledge, or it would be it would be or it would be a little bit out of the way and. Be- and very, and um, a lot of a lot of 
a lot of point and click games, especially in the nineties, were very guilty of this. Um Yeah. Hitchhiker's yes, Guide to the Galaxy um is probably one of the most bla probably one of the most blatant examples of hand breaking, although I'm not in I'm not entirely sure if that if that was supposed to be the joke because it's Douglas Adams. Seven year old me never made it out of Arthur Dent's house alive. So <laughs> I no, I get you. Um I, I agree with you on that. Um I will say that Yehuda's book Return of Zaltec, mm -hmm. d it takes great pains to not do that because I know exactly what you're talking about. Pour maple syrup on a cat and then brush the hairs of his off the cat to make a fake mustache so you can create a disguise to get past the guard. Yeah. Yeah, that's complete. Uh, Yehuda's got this pretty cool thing where, and I would say his is one of the few game books that actually suffers for its randomization aspect where he's got these puzzles in it and you have to look at every page and really take notice of things, take notes of what you're seeing. Um, you do encounter enemies and there's a combat system. Uh, and to be honest, you, if you want to get through the game, you'd have to grind through a lot of combats just to level yourself up. Mm -hmm. But if he were to take that element out and it, you could just say, you know, I win this combat or I run away. Um, this game has hidden alphabets. It's got uh, secret codes. It's got things where make a mental note of every rock you see, you know, write them down because the puzzles are, there's enough hand holding, I guess, just by looking at the page, but he definitely doesn't force feed you anything. And I don't want to say anything because if you, if you check it out, the return of Zeltek, it's a pretty entertaining book. Just don't worry so much about the fights. Um, I think personally, the book would have been way more uh, enjoyable if it didn't have all the fights. That said, like the fight at the end, it kind of makes sense that you have to have it. But um, I think his is an example of a game book that would be better without randomization. It's brilliant. It's brilliant as it is, but I really wish we didn't always have to have randomization. And I say this as someone who, <laughs> who is exclusively made books with randomization. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a nice little crutch for the designers to, to make some encounters deadly or some not. Uh, in, in the last game book I did, it was called The Iron Uprising. Uh, I was inspired a lot by Jedi Fallen Order for the part where the bounty hunters keep coming after you. Mm -hmm. To where In this one, bounty hunters keep coming after you, but there are random spots where they might hit you or they might not, and you, you roll a die and you see who you've encountered uh, off a list of like six of them. So it makes the narrative change a little. Um, but there could have been another way to handle that, I suppose. <laughs> I was just doing that for replay value. I think it certainly has a place and it should be in a lot of books, but I really would be happy to see a bunch of games that somehow had some sort of deep mechanical thing to satisfy the people who like the crunch mm -hmm. while also just being able to be played, you know, on the bus or on your lunch break without busting out a pair of D6s. Oh yeah, I can get I can I can certainly get that. Um Now when it come, now be, would it would it be fair to would it be fair to say that your stance is that is that um a randomizer should only be used when it when it's when it's something that fits what that game book is trying to be. Yep. Instead I, instead of just using it for tradition's sake. Yeah, I, I think so. I think everyone wants to make a fighting fantasy or a lone wolf, so that's what they do, and there's nothing wrong with that. But mm -hmm. I think they shouldn't feel that they're beholden to, you know, dice combat or mechanics like that. They could do a randomizer from a deck of playing cards. You know, I've been trying to figure out a way where your buddy would send you, like stick playing cards or envelope or uh, bookmarks in an envelope and randomly 
you know, give them to you and you have to draw them out of the envelope and put them in pages. But I'm, it, you know, I'm rambling, but I think just carrying a set of dice around with you doesn't have to be the only thing. I do remember, I do remember Lone Wolf having that, having that weird little, um, grid thing at the back, at the back of some of their books, <laughs> which I'm not entirely sure if it's a better or worse thing, but it's certainly an interesting thing. Um, I I would sometimes I would sometimes try and replicate a to a um d6 roll by by throwing a um by throwing a number two pencil. Oh, you know you know a pen one of the those those a lot of number two pencils would have six sides on them, so I would just write one through I would write one through six on it, and you and use that as a substitute. That makes sense. And there was a Kickstarter. Someone made pencil dice. Mm -hmm. um, there's a... There's a tool called Silent Dice. A guy on Reddit put together. Um, and that's where you take a number. You think of a random number. And if you're doing it, if you look at the minute hand of a clock or on your watch... You can use that as your seed number. You multiply the second digit by six and add it to the first number and use the rightmost number, rightmost digit of the new number as your number. So like if right now it's 539 where I'm at, so 39, um, six times three is 18, plus nine is 27. Uh, so then seven is my new number or something like that. Oh, no, 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 you, it, it's something like that anyways, but there, you can write it down so that people can play silently if they want to. Mm -hmm. Now that, br that brings me to the, that brings me to the concept of, con of converting a, converting a game book into a, into a tabletop RPG, which is one of those things that ev even from my perspective, I get the, I get the feeling is full is full of pitfalls. I think there, there are. Um, if it's done by the right people, uh, there's definitely uh, a path to success doing it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think every system is suitable for it, or that every designer can. I, I might be able to. I don't know. But if you look at say. Um, you know, we've been talking about Lone Wolf and Fighting Fantasy. Lone Wolf has a very persistent universe. Mm -hmm. um, I I didn't actually get into Lone Wolf until I was in my twenties, and you know, I don't, I'm not really into that kind of fantasy anymore. But uh, I read the first two series of it, and uh, they even had at its peak in the late '80s, early '90s an entire world compendium book. There was like a monthly newsletter where people would answer, ask questions of Joe Deaver. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of world building behind it. And I know they've made two full on RPGs from it that I've been told are successful. I haven't played them. Um, they, there are. And to, and to be, to be quite honest, one of, one of them, I very much like the other one. Um, not at, not as much. Gotcha. Um, there was all. There was also. There was also that attempt at a video game, which was um, all all right. Although, I really didn't get into it until it got until it got ported over the PC because you're not paying me enough to put to put up with um, to put up with mobile games. I hate mobile games, and I'm going to. Oh, keep, no. I'm going to keep hating mobile games until someone puts until someone ties me down and forces me to stop at gunpoint, with a howitzer. <laughs> I get you there. But the fur as far as as far as I'm aware with Lone Wolf, there are two there are two um and there are two attempts. And I think I think look I think looking at these two can can provide a bit of um a bit of perspective on so, on some the first one was what was, as I recall, called the multiplayer edition of Lone Wolf. It was okay. published by Mongoose, who has a good track record. And it was using the D20 system. The problem that I had was 
for one, timing. This was right smack dab in the middle of the of the OGL bubble phase that I've referred to from 2000 to 2005. And at that at that point, the the idea of the idea of doing lone lone the idea of doing D twenty D20, but Lone Wolf was far, was far from interesting to me, especially when D and D is already kind of dipping into that style of fantasy as it is. Um, yeah. but I, yeah. the more recent one, which unfortunately Cubicle Seven no longer has the rights to, which is why they ended up doing a sales a sales push on on um, Bundle of Holding not too long ago. What was a completely in-house um, system? It was. It wasn't. It wasn't using a, exi a existing setup as a base. It was. It was built from the ground up for that particular game. Um, and okay. in my in my not in my not so humble opinion, the latter what the latter was the better option. Putting aside the fact that um, Cubicle Seven already had a already had a very lengthy track record of of adapting other IPs into their it into their own materials um because this is the same studio that did that did the one ring and di and did the best doctor who trpg just to name a cup just to name a couple examples but do you but when it comes to adapting ga adapting game books to a full on role playing game do you think do you think that something like that is better served with its own system, or the, or in some cases it's better served um, adapting in, adapting into an existing rule set? Mm. Well, that's that's interesting. I don't think whatever the answer is, it's definitely not <laughs> three point five Pathfinder D twenty OGL stuff is never the answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I know the advanced fighting fantasy RPG, the full-on RPG that Arian Games does. Mm -hmm. That, if, from what I've read, because I have Stellar Adventures, their sci-fi version. Yeah. Uh, that looks like it uses pretty much just the same rules from any standard fighting fantasy game, like from the books. Mm -hmm. And it, it plays well. It's um, It's got a few little additions to make it kind of have a bit of a traveler feel, but also... Uh, traveler by way of like Blake Seven or some other disco era uh, sci-fi space opera is what it feels like to me, but that's just me. Um, I think you know the the original system used for Lone Wolf. I don't know how well that would play into a group RPG. So it depends, but I think. If you're going with something that's got an already well-known and evocative setting, you're probably better off either making your own brand new rule system, somehow multiplayerizing the game rules, but definitely not making D20 your go-to for it. Yeah, I do. Th I do think that some that some non-D20 systems would would be would could be could be adequately served, but. Um... But there, but there are some. There are some that de there are some that definitely would not. Um, I do. Th that said, I do think that on s on some levels, um, more o a more OSR ish take would be would be a better fit. Depending on depending on the game in question. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't mistake my no D twenty thing for like the OSR rule systems that are coming out. You know, like black hack and OSE and all that, that would be fine. It's just the, the 3.0, 3.5 Pathfinder that is played out. Mm -hmm. um, oh, shoot. You know, it's funny because Fighting Fantasy started off as its own solo game book thing, and then um, Advanced Fighting Fantasy. But have you ever played Troika? Once. I... Fighting fantasy. It's it's just fighting fantasy. You know, you got your your skill, your luck, and your two d six, and it's just adapts fighting fantasy out. I've 
I I did a little homebrew like way to um it, it was for one of my game books, the uh Stormwing, for how to play through Stormwing as a Troika character if you wanted. Mm-hmm. Which means basically as a fighting fantasy character, or using the adventure generator system at the back of Stormwing to to make Troika adventures, which kind of means to make, you know, uh fighting fantasy adventures using the the generators. Mm-hmm. But I don't get a, don't get upset with me, but I actually think powered by the apocalypse would be a pretty cool system to to port and use as a game book. I think um their their results of, you know, six or less, seven to nine or ten and up you know, ten and up. See this page. Seven and nine. See this page. Six and six and under. Well, you know what's coming. Um, I think it would actually be stronger as a game book than it is as a current tabletop RPG. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people are not. They they backlash against it, and for you know valid reasons. But um, I would l- when it comes to when it comes to something like that, I would a- I would actually. Ri- I I see where you're going with with um, powered by the apocalypse, but I would I would raise you one on that. I think I think I think if there's something that's adjacent to PBTA that could that could certainly work in a game book setup. Um, something like Blades in the Dark, which I ca- I, I count as a kind it. of Blades in the Blades in the Dark. Um, it. Started out as a started out as a hack of um of powered by the apocalypse, but as time has gone on, it's kind it's kind of changed into becoming its own thing. Which is which is why instead instead of powered by the apocalypse, you have forged in the dark. Right, like scum and villainy is one of them, right? Um, I believe I believe so. Because yeah, I have that one. Actually, actually, yeah, actually, yeah, it is. Um, but a lot now, Blades in the Dark was very much th- was very much themed around heists. It's, vi- I'd say, I'd say one of, I'd say one of its bigger inspirations was the um, Thief games. Okay. And because because of the because of the fact that you ha- that you have a you have individual sheets and a gr- and a group sheet. Um, when, mm-hmm. Now, in Blades in the Dark, that group sheet is meant to represent something like a hideout. But I do, th- I do think that kind of setup is could be could be um, completely amenable to um, a game book to RPG conversion. Um, putting putting something like that putting something like that aside, I th- I think I honestly think I honestly think that some, that um. That the cipher system would would work well for game book conversion. I can see that. Um, I think you'd have to do a little bit with the uh, uh, with the resource handling. You know how you're basically using you've got three sets of HP and you're using some of them to power your abilities. Mm-hmm. I think you'd have to maybe simplify a few things, but I've, I've had the thought too about like Numenera game books or something like that. They would be pretty fun, I think. And well, in the, in the case of a Numenera style game book, that would be, that would be a, that would be an, that would be a fairly appropriate way to explore the weirdness that Numenera is supposed to highlight, which is something yeah. that a lot of people kind a lot of people kind of, kind of miss when they, when they look at Numenera, the th- is the fact that the whole the whole point with that particular setting, the ninth world, is that you are taking Clark's law and putting it to its furthest extreme. Right. Which is, I remember I remember seeing people I remember seeing people arguing about whether Numenera counts as fantasy or counts as SF. The answer to that question is yes. Uh huh. the The whole point is that the is that. The line, but the line between the two has become so blur- has become so blurred that it's impossible to tell the difference. Yeah. Um. Oh, well, cer- it's certainly not, it's it can certainly be one of it can certainly be one of those things or lean t- or lean towards it, but the 
but at the end of the day, it's going to go down as weird fiction more than anything else. Yes, I agree. Um, but when... Pink, uh... Go ahead. Oh, it's just... Uh, if you want to see a subtler example of that, I think Kevin Crawford's World Without Numbers does that a little better. Yeah, I'm... Cause... I'm... I'm very familiar with um with with Crawford's work. That that guy is an yeah. absolute genius. You you uh interviewed him, didn't you? Crawford? No. He no. doesn't he doesn't take interviews. Um he yeah, he is a genius because if you're reading Worlds Without Number, uh it becomes pretty obvious as you're reading it if you know Stars Without Number that like those I forget what they're called, but those new weapons, those heavy ranged weapons are clearly just rail guns. Yeah. Yeah, and like all the, it's, it's, he doesn't say it explicitly, but if you know the system, it's obvious that Worlds Without Number is just the far future of Stars Without Number. Yeah, and give, given the fact that, um, st that Stars Without Number has, as of, had a, in the deluxe version, um, had notes for integrating aspects of Godbound into, into its setup, um, I'm not surprised that there is that that there is that cross compatibility. That's been that's been something of a highlight with his, within his work. Yeah, genius. Um, and admittedly, cross compatibility is something that I'd like to see happen more often. But I realize why it doesn't. Um, I'd say, although although it would be ver although it would be fairly tricky to do, I'd say an I'd say another one that could wor that could work with that kind of game book conversion. Is the yin yang system that's in feng shui? You'd have to yeah. you'd have to pair, you'd have to pare it down you'd have to pare it down quite a bit. But at the end of the at the end of the day, you are rolling to, you are rolling two d six with a yin, with a yin yang setup versus a versus a versus a modifier or versus a versus a target number I should say. Um. And. I'd say I'd say the only th I'd say the only thing that'd be tricky about it is the way is the way um, especially Feng Shui Two handles initiative. That might be a bit tricky to track and to track in a game book. Okay. Um, yeah, I've not played Feng Shui. Is it similar? The Yin Yang system is it similar to um, uh, Chen? Because where you have a black dice and a white dice, and you want them to be closer together. Yes, and the best result is when you can get them to match. Okay. And um, I'm kind of familiar with that from another game. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, one of the, incidentally another game that I've cut that I've covered, although I although I've never interviewed the developers of Keen. Um, they'd prob I'd probably have to deal with a language barrier in the process since they're in um, France. Right. Um. But that, do, but there is one elephant in the room reg regarding the, regarding the con regarding the conversion, and that's taking something that's designed more often than not for one player, um, something like Blood Sword, notwithstanding, and bringing in multiple people. Mm -hmm. In um, from your pers from your perspective, what um. What would, what are some of, what are some of the pitfalls that can that can happen when do, when doing that kind of thing? Well, you you do lose perhaps the feeling of the the master of your own destiny in that uh, everyone's going to want to be guiding the ship a little bit, um, mm -hmm. and then you have to one reason why I like making game books, it's really easy to make one encounter with one angry bear versus one player than thinking about, well, four, you know, are four people going to just beat the snot out of this bear <laughs> and it's not going to be any fun. Um, so there's, there's less, or th rather when you're doing it multiplayer, there's more that you have to take into consideration for uh, balance and pacing. Mm -hmm. But, I feel like you can pretty easily hand wave that by saying make two bears. <laughs> um, <laughs> but my, I think the harder concern would be uh, consistency in the game world mm -hmm. um, fiction. Uh, I try 
and it's hard when it's a game book where every bit of the story is being explicitly thrown into your face as opposed to something like what Kevin Crawford does where it's very sandboxy and he says these are the guidelines you know make it up as you go which is how I've always made uh, multiplayer RPGs with with a minimal I try and do the minimal effective can you know it, here's here's some kings here's some castles these guys like these guys and these guys don't like these guys. And here's how you can make more if you want. Mm -hmm. But if you're, if you're coming at that converting lone wolf or fight, fighting fantasy, those books have reams of canon that you'd have to consider. Uh, the besides like starship traveler and the sci-fi ones, um, a lot of those fighting fantasy books happen on, on a world called Titan, right? Mm -hmm. Except for one of them takes place on a world called orb, which is the world from way of the tiger, which is another game book series. Um, but you, you know, if you've got 80 books in a series, it's gonna, it's gonna be impossible to get everything consistent. Would, would it be, would it be fair to, would it be fair to say that, that, um, with when trying when trying to do that kind of thing, that there's a bit of continuity lockout. Yeah, definitely. That's the term I was trying to go for. So thank you. Continuity lockout. It can affect you um, in a in a pretty big way, which is something I'm facing in my series uh, because I do want to make one more book in the one or two in the story that started with Stormwing, especially because mm -hmm. Uprising only tangentially touches on that. Um, but to not lock out the world because at the end of each of the books, there's here's how to take the story off in another direction. So I kind of just, you know, there's the baby at the end or in the middle of Stormwing uh, that shows up. I kind of want to, give some guidelines on where that storyline's going, but not to overdevelop it. Cause I think it would be fun to do a, you know, a group game mm -hmm. in that setting. And I'd and to be, to be fair, something like continuity lockout is, is, is no, is no stranger to just, um, to just, to just game books. There's, I can think I can think of my fair share of um ro of role playing games and war games that are just that are just as guilty of that if not more so. Um as much as I love L5R to death it is very much guilty of this kind of thing also known as meta plot. Um Yeah. Shadowrun's also guilty and I'd I'd say I'd say one of the one of the biggest guilty parties when it comes to continuity lockout and what makes getting into getting into it a bit daunting. Is BattleTech? I will say, yeah i I've seen all that stuff, and it's just I've not played it partially because of wow, that looks like a lot. So i I agree with you there. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's grant now granted. Granted, the video game adaptations of BattleTech have made it somewhat easier, but and um, that's also the reason why I'm thankful for for YouTubers who are make, who are making lore videos when it comes to a lot of these kind of topics because they make well they cer well they certainly make my job easier when I'm running that that game for game nights, <laughs> so I can so I can so I can point at one of those and say here's here's your ho here's your homework for, here's your homework for two weeks. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's a problem when it comes to writing. You know, it's really easy. Uh, or, oh, Seventh C was another one with the meta plot where people uh, felt like they got locked out, which I loved Seventh C. Um, but I can I can see the issue that people had. Yeah. Where. So I guess actually, yeah, it. Now that you explain those games, it really wouldn't affect it any worse than it does with, uh, you know, whatever else. But you still got to be careful. Mm -hmm. I th I think when I think when it comes to 
when it came when it came to the the most recent version of advanced fighting fantasy, it seemed to it seemed to use stuff like the stuff like the Warlock of Firetop Mountain, i.e., the most the most popular um, fighting fantasy book from 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 my recollection, as kind as kind of the t as kind of the template for their particular sandbox. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's something that's easy to grasp, but there's also enough there so you can go off in the crazier directions that fighting fantasy went if you want to. Right. Um, and I think I think um I think providing that kind of, that kind of baseline is important. Whereas with 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 some with some other ones, as long as you provide a as long as you provide a a decent premise about the about the setting, um, then you'll be largely fine. Like with say Lone Wolf, you're in a you're in a fantasy setting. You're a you're a Kai Lord. You have you are you have a lot of different skills, including a including a very strong sword. Yes. But you should always get hunting because you're gonna need that like three times in a book. Mm -hmm. Book, uh. <laughs> always get hunting. <laughs> or... Always get, always get hunting, and the summer sword is more trouble than it's worth. Uh, just if you, do, oh, what was it? Leave it at home in book four, and then otherwise you're good. Mm -hmm. Um. Also, uh, get Kai Alchemy as soon as it's available because <laughs> you have to use it a million times. But. I think I think this I think all I think all those choices also highlights why maybe it's just maybe it's just me but I think I think a lot of the I think a lot of the RPG systems or even the in-house stuff that would fit a lot of game books don't use class systems. At best they use archetypes but they don't use full-on classes. Yeah, I don't think I've seen really any of that. Well, I remember. I remember a long time ago, some someone asked me how I would write out a Kai Lord um, class for um, Fifth Edition, and I don't know if somebody's already done it. Knowing my luck, somebody probably has. But for me personally, I wouldn't do it. Large, largely because, largely because, for one, all I'd have is just a ranger who's who's significantly less shitty, because Five E rangers suck. But two. When you consider when you consider the when you consider the skill op, how the how the choice of skill determines how you're going to go through the books in Lone Wolf, trying to consolidate that into a class is sword fighting a fart. <laughs> <laughs> sword fighting a fart. I like that. Just if some if someone took if someone took if the choice between. The, just the choice of say of, of say take of say taking alchemy when you get when you get it changes changes so much and the whole the whole thing is while you're at, well while there are certain while the while the idea of the kai lord is certainly drawing upon the motif of the of the rangers specifically the ranger of the rangers of the north from lord of the rings mm -hmm. um there's that's there's still a lot of different paths that you can take with that and that kind of runs counter to the very specific role design that is in class-based systems. Right. Which I realize that kind of thing sounds odd when I meant when I mentioned that Cypher would work cuz while Cypher technically has a class system, it's not the it's not exactly the same. It No. <laughs> it's a lot more less linear and and more free form and a lot of freedom to create what you want within it. Yeah, if 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 anything you if anything you have um if anything you have two classes right out you have two or three classes right out of the gate, um the t the type which is get which is going to be a lot more horizontal in its development and the focus which is far more specific. Um, and the the descript the descriptor is. Uh, is basically ba is basically background, but even but even with even with that, you have three moving parts that are going to result in a lot of a lot of variety. So even though even though it is kind of going with that whole um, warrior rogue mage trinity, um, it's not it's not exactly the same. It's it is more on the level of archetypes, um, right? 
whereas some something like say as much as I like Elf as much as I like um L five R and and um Shadowrun, those two are games with a class system that don't want to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> like as freeform as Shadowrun has been over the years, let's let's face it, whenever you're sitting down it's a case of Okay, who's okay? Who's the face? Who's the street Sam? Who's the mage? Who's the hacker, or Decker in the older games? You you get the idea. Yep. Um, it's not as egregious in in L five R, but you but the closest thing to a class has always been your choice of school. Yeah, and I I say that it really, especially with some of those schools, uh sorry getting caught up here uh that they um they are more restrictive in a lot of ways than some of the classes that they emulate because uh you can like with the ninja if you if you play a ninja in let's say whatever edition we're thinking of here um there is one type of ninja can impersonate people. One type of ninja is good with poisons. You know, one type of ninja is good at sneaking in the shadows. And if you're playing like 5e, which I don't really play 5e, but like if you're playing it, you're going to be able to uh, customize your class with different archetypes. You'll get more variety out of a 5e game and more versatility out of your character classes than you will with L5R. Oh. Are you are you talking are you, are you talking five e d and d or five e um l five r five e d and d um as f when it comes to, when it comes to cl when it comes to cla when it comes to um when it comes to that kind when it comes to that kind of thing i i both ag i both agree and disagree um depending depending on certain depending on the class in D and D, there is a very all roads lead to Rome, especially if you're not playing a caster, because we're because we've apparently regressed to that whole linear warriors shit. Um, but when it when it comes to when it comes to something like L five R, the um, I'd say I'd say I'd say depend I'd say um, especially in especially in um, fourth and fifth edition L five R. It's not the um there's the restrictions aren't as much aren't as much there the I'd say the I'd say the restriction comes from the from comes from the certain the certain skills that are demand that are more demanded of you or 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 are cheaper to advance so there's the temptation to focus exclusively on the on those skills instead of branching out okay and I can see that. Um, um but and that and that and that that is that is certainly an, that is certainly an issue and that's I think I honestly I honestly think that the the kind of skill system that's in a lot of role playing games um wouldn't translate all that well to a game book like the skill yeah the skill system in say L five R or 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 seventh C wouldn't wouldn't fit simply simply because a lot of those skills are way too specific. Completely agree. You're gonna have to, you know, make sure you put in a check for use rope and handle animal in every book. You have you have no idea how much I absolutely hated use rope as an individual skill. Oh, dude, you didn't see my tweet the other day. I said uh, we should make a dump stat RPG based just on 3.5. The only uh, attributes are charisma and constitution, and the only skills are handle animal and use rope. And uh, uh, Paul, oh, shoot, you know, um, wrote liminal. Mm -hmm. He comes along and he says, uh, well, you know, you just made a cowboy RPG, Paul Michener. He's like that would be a roundup. That would be a rodeo. He <laughs> used rope and handle animal. But yeah, no, I I despise it too. Yeah, I I um. 
I've I've gotten some flack for saying this, but I don't I don't think D and D was ever was um, should ha should have a skill system because it was never designed for it. No. And whenever I bring that kind of thing up, some people point to the old skill list that fe that thieves had. That's a class mm -hmm. feature that doesn't count. Exactly. Like it was, it wasn't something that it, it wasn't something that it was that was inbuilt, and that's why I like the fact that Thirteenth um, Age, a game that, a game that I've sung praises of for years, didn't even bother with a skill system; just had a set of backgrounds you'd spend points in. And it's a case of if it counts for if it's relevant, if the GM says it's relevant for the check, it counts. Nice. Um. But I, I. But when it comes to, when it comes to the, there's one other um one other significant issue that pr that props up with both role playing games and with um game books in my opinion that I could see being tr I could see being tricky and that's puzzles. Um, in your opinion, what are what are some of the right and wrong ways to do some to do some sort of some sort of puzzle in a game book? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I'm not kidding. About 30 seconds before you asked that question, I was on drive through and the current deal of the day is Wally DM's Journal of Puzzle Encounters, and I bought it as you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not so great at puzzles. Um so uh, I'm looking at Wally DM's Journal of Puzzle uh Okay, so puzzles and game books. Mm -hmm. I actually have been working on them a lot uh, where appropriate. There is... Well, I didn't read them anymore because they had, they had demons in them, and I don't do anything like that anymore, but the Grail Quest books mm -hmm. had some interesting puzzles. Um, that book that I talked to you about earlier today, uh, The Return of Zaltek, mm -hmm. I... Yehuda Shapira, that has such really nicely integrated puzzles. Um, but he's got some that you don't realize they are puzzles. Uh, I guess, okay, spoiler alert for anyone who's going to play Return of Zaltek, but if if you notice the, some pebbles with strange markings on them and different pictures, because every page is a picture, mm -hmm. write those down. Because then when you find some other spot where there's there's something to work out there. Um, I like puzzles in game books. I like uh, them to be a little fairer, though, because I think my all-time most hated one is Starship Traveler in Final F or Fighting Fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, spoilers if anyone's not played it, but uh, it's basically Voyager or Lost in Space. And halfway through the book, you you get to this point of no return where you find out that you're going to die in X amount of time if you don't make it to specific coordinates, but you don't know the coordinates. And so you're kind of on the lookout for coordinates, but there are multiple paths you can take. And at one point, you come to the, the absolute final point of no return where they say you need to jump. What are the coordinates you've collected? There is at no point anything indicating whether path A, which went through points B, C, and D, or path B, which went through G, H, E, and F, uh, is better or worse. So you'll have paid attention, you'll have collected these three coordinates, and you'll put them together, and you jump, and then it says you died. There's only one way, one correct way through the game, and it's n it's random. Like, it, the choices you make to get there are no more or less valid than the others. And I wish in the case where it was something blind like that, and it would have taken a lot more work, <laughs> but where some of those jumps would have ended up to safe places, just maybe not the right place, and you could have had the option of going back and trying something else. Mm -hmm. So I think puzzles need to be, if not obvious right away at least obvious in hindsight with proper clues um like if you're playing return of zeltek you get to the point where those pebbles make sense 
oh, okay, you know. Uh, or there's another part where a secret alphabet where the ability to decipher the secret alphabet is pretty simple, you know, if you're paying attention. Mm-hmm. But it's there's nothing in the game that, in that book, that tells you that there's a puzzle. You just have to know it. Um, I So just that balance of being uh you know well hand breaking and like you said but i really disliked that puzzle in starship traveler it requires you to go completely through the book multiple times while uh, while also while also also be also um some, somehow be, somehow being being psyching. i th- i think i think in a similar kind of puzzle i said okay Okay, what you, have, what you have to do it what you have to do is look up the guide, do st- do step A, step B, step step C1, step uh, self alpha 6 and ma- and make sure you have the make sure you have the gold and silver ring and are, pre- are performing this on the on the 31st of a given month on a full moon night. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's I I mean I'm not playing <sighs> a game book to to have like you know for my resume to send to the nsa as a code breaker i like to i'm a nerd i like to do cryptograms and ciphers in my spare time Mm -hmm. for fun but i don't like game books necessarily that are all about how clever they are um I don't know. It, it, there has to be a little bit of hand holding in them. Thank you, kiddo. Um, because it's th- that's what the book is doing already in the first place is guiding you through a story. It's uh, th- okay. What it is is there's this trust between you and the game book author. Um, you have to. Uh, Okay, I'm trying to write it. You're trusting them to lead you to so- to fun, <laughs> and if if they're withholding some things, just to withhold them, it's not fun. Mm-hmm. So, you know. so with given now given given that kind of thing, do you do you think that a rely a reliable um a rel- a would you say would you say that it would be easier to do a puzzle in a game book versus doing it in a role playing game? Oh, my daughter's here. She says yes. Um, <laughs> I I kind of think so. I'm, I mean, there are some things in the format that lend them to it. Uh, you know, the one of the classic types of um, puzzles in these games is uh, using since you have not necessarily page numbers, but paragraph numbers Mm -hmm. where you pick up clues that lead you to the correct paragraph number. Uh, I think one of the lone wolf games has like a number of islands on the map. If you notice that you should go West this way. Um, And the books that I write have a tag system or keyword system. And I got those from grail quest and from in, uh, virtual reality and some other series and i think you can do some pretty cool uh puzzles with that it seems and i'm going to share on dropbox with you Mm -hmm. the return of zaltech just because it's so brilliant in how he does his puzzles but there is um a visual aspect too you know you're looking at the page your illustrations can be part of the uh puzzle but you have to be obvious enough with it you can't just assume that people are going to get it because i don't know i'm just all about fairness i guess Mm -hmm. all right that's i definitely i definitely appreciate you sending that you sending that my way so i have a um frame of so i have a frame of reference yeah um zaltech was done Yehuda is a pretty cool artist, and he did it intentionally to look like something you would find in the binder of a middle school kid around the time when you and I were teenagers. Mm-hmm. 
who is making his own computer game, but in his notebook at school. Yeah, um, I can get I can get behind that kind of concept. Yeah, uh, but if you are looking, um, there are puzzle elements already on uh, page eight, uh, page nine. If you, if you if you go to page nine, you'll see exactly what I was talking about. It's pretty obvious that that's a puzzle. Yeah. And if you visit it early on, you kind of know what to look out for. Um, but there are multiple puzzles in it, and you can get little things. Uh, if you go to per, page sixteen, mm -hmm. see there's some there's two actual different puzzles on that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can, I can, cer I can certainly see, I can certainly see that. It, I'll, it'll take a, it'll, I won't be able to look at it. I won't be able to look at that puzzle now because Dropbox is being a bit, being a bit slow on my end, unfortunately. Okay. Um. But all, but all that said, I think, I think if there's any takeaway from from this from this whole endeavor is that, um. Conversion can conversion can happen, but. It, but just like just like with any sort of conversion, it's not a, it's not a case where there is a one size fits all. You need the, you need the right set of rules and that match the right kind of game. Yes. Um, which isn't too, isn't too far for, far removed from any from any other conver conversion at as some as somebody who's gotten who's gotten asked dumb um dumb questions like how I'd how I'd convert um. A long time ago, I got asked how to convert how I'd convert Ghost in the Shell to, um, to sh to Shadowrun, and I'm like, well, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even use Ghost in the Shell, <laughs> or, or rather, I wouldn't even use Shadowrun for that. I'd use, um, Cyberpunk. Right. Um. It's not, that's no dis no disrespect to Shadowrun. It's just you're if you're dealing if you're dealing with a set with a setting that doesn't have a whole lot of supernatural material, why use it? Exactly. Um, I remember. I remember. I remember some. I remember someone are stating that saying that that um that that they could that you could easily ad you could easily adapt um Final Fantasy into D and D. And while I've seen it done, um, I find the I find the more in house ver attempts to be more to be more interesting, where people had to create the had to create a specific system around it, since you're dealing with certain, whenever you're doing these kind of adaptations, you're dealing with certain baggages. Yeah. But that, I wouldn't do mm -hmm. Chrono Trigger in a D20. No, um, especially, especially, especially when, especially when, well, I could see, I could see someone trying, I could see someone thinking that they'd have to do it in D20 in 2002. Um, yeah, you know when when pe when people's options weren't all that open. These days, to be quite honest, I'd um I'd probably use feng shui for that. Okay. Um, that's one that's one possibility. Or if I use if I were to use D twenty, um, I would rather I would rather use something that I would rather use one of the um D twenty hacks. You know something something like legend system or um or iron heroes yeah i'd i'd want something that moved pretty fast mm -hmm. but oh in that regard you'd probably be better off using savage worlds yeah yeah savage trigger um oh. I don't have any plans on do on doing that any anytime soon because I've got a different um, Final Fantasy pl um, thing planned. But that but it's cer it's certainly something to consider. Um, yeah. But with all, with all that said, I would like to thank thank you um, for braving the hell of time zones to come back and talk and and talk talk game books and j and just um just play it by ear like we always do here. Yeah. Oh. I appreciate you having me. I it's been it's been pretty great.
Yep. And of course, anytime anytime you see fit to return, you the door is always open, and you know the way up the mountain. <laughs> oh. Sorry, my puppy. <laughs> oh. And and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and listen to the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>